So today we're here to talk about uh, engaging with Aboriginal individuals and organisations through uh, CDATS and we're really privileged to have Flick Ryan and Rob Monaghan from Big River Connections with us today, so welcome. And uh, I'd like to invite you, Rob, if you don't mind, to uh, do an acknowledgement of country for us. Thank you, Dennis. Um, before we do commence today and have our yarn, I'd just like to acknowledge that uh, we're on Gadigal country. Um, both of us are visitors today to this beautiful country. I'd also like to acknowledge um, our elders, past and present, um, and acknowledge um, Aboriginal people that live around this area and um, have a connection to uh, the Gadigal land. So thank you for inviting us along. Maybe we could start by you telling us a bit about yourselves, your background and uh, where, where you're from and uh, what you've been doing. Yeah, thank you, Dennis. Look, um, my name's obviously Rob Monaghan. I'm a Bunjalung Gumbangi boy from up on the north coast of New South Wales. I live in this beautiful country of Grafton. I've um, got, uh, you know, long background in health, so well over, well, almost 30 odd years in health. Um, I've worked with this lady here for many years through consultancy. I have a separate consultancy called Monaghan Dreaming, um, but I've had the opportunity to work with Felicity. Um, also have ties to uh, the University of New South Wales. Um, but yeah, our passion is, you know, our community members um, uh, and working with organisations that have a have a uh, service delivery to Aboriginal community um, and, uh, you know, seeking advice and guidance from those uh, services that they ask of us. Great. Thank you. And Flick. So, yeah. Dennis, I'm a Wadi Wadi woman. So, mm. my mum's family come from Milu, which is the Murray River, um, on the Victorian side. Um, strong family connections to Yorta Yorta people um, and somewhat to Wamba Wamba people as well from down that area. Um, my dad must acknowledge his background as well. So, my dad was um, of Scottish background from around the Glasgow area. Mm -hmm. uh, so my work background's mostly been in what I would term health and welfare services. So uh, family violence services, uh, child protection, out of home care services, and now have been training as an independent contractor for about 15 years. We get to provide workshops uh, for non-Aboriginal people, but as Rob said, um, a lot of our passion is to work with our own mob around things like lateral violence and self-care mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. So as I said, we're here to talk about uh, how CDATS can best engage with Aboriginal people and uh, organisations. And it, it's really important, I think, first of all, to understand the background to um, the difficulties that some uh, Aboriginal uh, organ individuals and organisations might have in terms of engaging effectively in activities related to the broader community. So would you like to speak to that particular issue? I think, um, Dennis, some of the barriers are probably due to past policies and practices that, that are quite recent. Mm -hmm. um, so I think um, we have people who have been impacted by those policies and practices in the past and, and therefore that will often lead to mistrust of service providers as well. Mm -hmm. So I think that's one of the barriers that, that we have to sort of confront um, and that see that workers might see out there in the community as well, that there's that sort of fear of mistrust mm -hmm. um, of services okay. largely. Okay. Yeah. And, and I guess that uh, comes about because all, all be it that CDATs are community-based organisations, it nevertheless is a government-sponsored program. And so we need to bear in mind that the um, suspicions um, based on past experiences uh, among Aboriginal people towards those sorts of organisations could also um, be uh, have effect for the, the CDATs. Yeah. yeah. No, that's a good point. And also, you know, uh, some of the barriers are... Uh sometimes physical we're, and geographical. Um, we have um, a disbursement of you know, Aboriginal people living right across Australia. Um, and in New South Wales, we have the highest population that live in not all cities. They live in remote and very remote areas um, that don't have uh, access to appropriate uh, services. Um, and distance is a problem sometimes for our, especially our remote communities um, that um, have, you know, uh, 
a, a proportion of their community that um, uh, do um, drink alcohol um, to levels that are sometimes, you know, at that higher level. But getting access to services is a is a problem. Yes, indeed. Mm. And one of the things that is striking from uh, a close examination of the National Drug Strategy uh, Household Survey from 2019 uh, that really struck me was the the difference between the um, the uh, patterns of substance use and the um, perceptions of substance use. The difference between people. Aboriginal people living in remote communities as opposed to those not living in remote communities. It was really quite stark, the contrast between the, um, the, the, the two. Yeah. Yeah. And, and to me, I guess that, that speaks to the fact that we can't make generalisations around saying, well, this is you know, the problem yeah. that Aboriginal people face because it isn't universal even across the state. Well, I think that's the beauty of CDAP programs being tailored mm. for particular uh, communities because yep. we are a really diverse mob of people. Yep. Um, you know, traditionally at, at least 350 different nations. Within the nations you have clans. Um, different geographical areas, obviously, different languages, and we've retained a lot of that diversity as well mm. um, as contemporary Aboriginal people. Mm -hmm. So I guess the key for CDAT workers is to hear from community um, because each community, as you've pointed out, is going to be, you know, starkly different perhaps Yes. Um, to the next community. Yeah, so if we can get that right, we're in for the long game. Yeah, exactly. And, and the long game is what it's all about, isn't yes. it? Yeah. 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 So w tell me why it is very important for to, to play the long game in terms of engagement with yeah. individuals and, and uh, organisations yeah. that represent them. Well, I think, you know, when you think about, uh, Flick talked about uh, colonisation, but this is a generational um, issue we're dealing with as well. So not only past generations, but also we want to make sure that our future generations um, are fully aware of, um, you know, the, um, I suppose, the, the, the use of alcohol. Um, and look, no one's out there saying that people cannot, you know, consume alcohol, but it's about how do we consume alcohol in a safe manner? Um, or, you know, how do we abstain from um, using alcohol? So I think what we need to do is in programs is not tell people not to do things, just give them enough information so they make informed choices for themselves. Yeah. So that's giving community ownership of the, the pathways they want to take in their, their um, in their, I suppose, their endeavours to, you know, around mm. uh, drug and alcohol. Mm. I think the other thing to consider is that in the past we've had several programs that have been almost like fly-in, fly-out yep. programs. Um, and one of the things I think that's really difficult for Aboriginal people is that we might have a program that comes in for three months um, and then disappears for maybe funding reasons or something like that or, or it, it hasn't had community buy-in. Yep. So the program might fail. Um, or there's no sort of evaluation, cultural evaluation of the program. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about being in the long game, the importance is, you know, intervention, for want of a better term, at the beginning of the program so that we can maintain that program for, you know, with consistency for a longer period of time. Yeah, sure. Because that's what's going to work better with our communities. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Also, outcomes, isn't it, about outcomes? How do we achieve outcomes? Because most programs that go into communities are not outcome-focused. Yep. But it needs to be outcome-focused that is, you know, driven by the community, owned by the community, like Flick said, and, and um, looking at what comes out at the other end through, you know, meaningful evaluations. And with those evaluations, how do we change? Because it's not a stagnant, um, you know, community. Our communities evolve all the time. Uh, our program need to evolve. Aboriginal communities, particularly remote Aboriginal communities, are, are more concerned themselves about cannabis use than about alcohol use. Yeah. Much more so in terms yeah. of, yeah, I don't know that's if that's really, something. Well, it's interesting because often when you talk to our mob, regardless of the substance that's yeah. being used in terms of what drug's being consumed, often our mob will throw back to cannabis. Yeah. Yeah. So... Even if someone is, um, you know, injecting a substance, yep. 
people will say, oh, it's a problem with the green or with the yardies. Yeah, so there's still some resistance in our community. Oh, even, even now there's a huge um, non-acknowledgement of, you know, ice in our communities. It's, yeah. it's uh, really tearing our communities apart, but there's no knowledge of, um, you know, this is a, a very stigmatised underlying conversation that's not being had in the communities. Yeah. Um, because it's, and it's so, um, uh, so rampant in our communities. Like marijuana was something that was, you know, um, engaged in, in, you know, from the 60s and 70s and it was sort of almost accepted in some communities that people did that. But now with the event of um, ISIS, yeah, having huge effects. But not only for the person that is taking it or, or using it, it's more effect for the, the ripple effect for families. You know, That's true. incarceration rates we're seeing going through the roof. We're seeing domestic violence going through the roof. Yeah. All those ripple effects from, you know, and in some ways drug and alcohol is, um, is a, in some ways an underlying cause for a lot of these things. But Yeah, I think because of our kinship mm -hmm. networks, when someone's um, being harmed mm -hmm. by alcohol or drug use, uh, it's never about the individual because we think collectively. So there's always a ripple effect in terms of the impact on family and community when someone's being harmed by those substances. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So. And that's a, a consideration that you, you don't broadly see outside of the um, non-Aboriginal yeah. uh, community. So, yeah. you know, I think this comes to the point that CDATs really do need to understand yeah. exactly what is going on within their community yeah. and what those yeah. attitudes are uh, in relation to those patterns yeah. uh, in order to understand that the that ripple effect. Yeah. The ripple. Mm. And the visual, like Aboriginal people are very visual. Yeah. Um, and even in their, you know, in their um, habits around drinking, like they might drink with it in the park, say, for instance, because, um, you know, colonisation dictated to them that they couldn't drink in pubs. Mm -hmm. They weren't allowed in pubs before we had, a, you know, the referendum. So all these things, Aboriginal people were forced to drink in parks. Now they're forced not to drink in parks or people see them in a different light. But Aboriginal people are very visual in the way they do and, um, and you, you will see that in a lot of, a lot of places. Yeah. yeah, much more visible because yeah. of those restrictions. And so if you partake in those sort of activities in a park, over time that becomes your social space yeah. to do that. Mm. Uh, but obviously that's where that stereotype can, can come mm. into play too because, you know, it's my understanding that the studies have been really, really clear over several years that fewer Aboriginal people actually drink uh, per mm. head than non-Aboriginal people. Yes. And mm. I think there was the overview of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health status uh, in 2019 that that um, actually stated that fewer Aboriginal people also drink at risky levels. So yep. I think we've got to be really careful about not playing into that stereotype as well. Exactly. Yep. Um, but most certainly we have to acknowledge that there are significant harms for some of our people around alcohol and drug use. Yep. Okay. For sure, that's really important to acknowledge that, yeah, yeah. and and to acknowledge the the impact that that has on the individuals, on society, the, the uh, families, and the rest of uh, yeah. the society. Yeah. yeah, that's great. So I guess that's a that's a good segue to um, to ask the question as to how can see that get more engagement and involvement from Aboriginal people. Uh, and organisations and ensure that the activities that they plan are much more relevant to yeah. helping uh, those people to understand and overcome the harms associated with drugs and alcohol. Yeah. Well, well there's lots of starting points I think we could talk about. Um, and, you know, even as Aboriginal people, when we go into Aboriginal communities, there's certain protocols that we need to abide by when we go in. So I think see that... Um, needs to take on board about, uh, you know, the protocols to go into Aboriginal communities, even if there are Aboriginal workers within CDAT. Um, obviously, uh, an Aboriginal workforce is, is a must if we're in this, working in this space. Um, you know, Aboriginal people will um, uh, take heed and listen to an Aboriginal person over li listening to 
a non-Aboriginal person. Um, and I think it's really important about ownership. We talk about ownership of mm. programs. So, you know, there's Aboriginal people in that community needs to have a seat at the table when we're designing, when we're delivering, um, and when we're evaluating these programs um, because not all programs are perfect. We're going to make mistakes, but how do we... How do we right the wrongs of those mistakes in the next, uh, you know, next time we do it? So those are some of the things that I think we should be looking at. Absolutely. And I think um, the other thing, you know, a really practical thing that I found really helped me as an Aboriginal person, not from a particular area that I was working in, was um, what I like to call family and community mapping. Mm -hmm. So I think what might be really helpful for CDAP workers is to um, sit down, take some time getting to know the community um, and just sort of desktop stuff really at the start. So one of the things that I would do is I would try and sit down, work out who the major families were in mm -hmm. the location and then from that I would move to who are the major Aboriginal organisations in the area, how are those organisations connected with the community and that, that would help me sort of it, it mm. really cemented that sort of information in whatever project I was going to work with with yeah. the community as well. But also looking at um, the cultural history, Dennis, of the area. Some areas have a, a, a terrible history um, mm. with Aboriginal people, terrible atrocities. Uh, so for CDAT workers just practically really important that they actually know the area because you don't want to be, say, having some sort of consultation in a culturally unsafe uh, location, you know, mm -hmm. where, where some atrocity yeah. has, has occurred in the past. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I think it's key that they know the community and then they know the area as well. Yeah. Okay. I think another just adding to that, um, you know, the, the issues we have around drug and alcohol cannot be solved by one single you know, organisation. Mm -hmm. So I think we, we work in silos too much. So yep. we need to be able to form, you know, meaningful, productive partnerships in communities that we work in um, because we can't solve all the problems. We have to have great partnerships in communities with other organisations that might not align, you know, directly with drug and alcohol, but they might have that holistic view on how we approach um, certain issues in our community. Yeah. Okay, that, that's really good. And to tie that in with this notion of being there for the long haul, of, of playing the long game, yeah. yeah, to approach the organisations and say, we don't want to just in, yeah. involve you in this little event that we've already largely got planned. Yeah. Yeah. We want to get them involved uh, from the beginning to go through that mapping process yeah. as a way of indicating that we really want to get together a body of knowledge about the, the Aboriginal people in our community that yeah. is going to enable us to do uh, a great service yeah. in, in the area we're working at for not just this year but next year and to yeah. act actually grow and continue to learn from the, um, the, the work that we're doing. Yeah, and that's, that's about capacity building, but it's also about, you know, we talk about self-determination and that's what we want to instill in our communities. And if organisations can do that, you know, such as CDAT, we've got to be on a winner. Wonderful, yeah. Look, I think that's a really great note to finish on. So uh, once again, I really thank you for your time. It's just been fabulous and uh, wish you all the very best. Thanks for having us, Dennis. Thanks, thanks for having us, Dennis. Thank you.